I'm uh, Jeremy Ring. I'm at Golan Lions in Bio 389. Uh, this talk is a collaboration between me and Martin Michelson. Uh, he's at Caltech. Um, he's, he goes to Professor for Software. Um, our research is on using game enhancers to enable offline video games to be played online. Uh, so we've been doing this research since 2004 when we were high school freshmen, just for fun. Um, but we didn't actually present in an academic setting until last year. And our work is sponsored by James Gilchrist, so he's also going to get some money us to about this. So a quick recap of our research that we presented last year, for those of you who are not familiar with which I'm guessing is a lot of you. Um, so game enhancement technology modifies the gameplay experience of a video game using reverse engineering. So we don't need the game's source code to make changes. So stuff like Game Genie, Game Shark, action replay. And from contrary to popular myth, we can do way more interesting stuff than just cheating, like infinite health. We don't cheat, we enhance. Um, so we work with online enablers, which is a class of game enhancers that allow multiplayer offline games to be played over the internet. And it's a really good example of an application of game enhancers that doesn't cheat the game. Um, in particular, we worked with the Nintendo GameCube and Wii consoles, but the Wii is unfinished at the moment. Um, our main inspiration was the X-Band, which was the first online enabler. It came in 1994, so quite a long time ago. And it patched the code of supported games to redirect two player activity over a modem. And it um, supported 38 games, but it was discontinued in 1997, so it didn't last that long. Uh, we loosely based our all enablers on the X-Band model. Um, the changes we made, at least the major ones, where XBand uses, uses a central server, whereas we use peer-to-peer -peer networking. XBand used and distributed specialized hardware. We use hardware that's already out there. And XBand added support for new games themselves. We make it easy for hobbyists to do that without our direct involvement. So for adding support for new games, um, our online enablers differ from XBand in that they function very similarly to general purpose game enhancers like action replay on and this goes right down to the actual format of the code to enable compatibility. So for our GameCube all enabler, the code format is exactly the same as Action Replay on GameCube. And there's a large community of code creators that already exists, so we can tap their numbers and expertise, and that makes adding new game support a scalable process. Um, so that's what we did for our GameCube all enabler, which is called GCars CS. Um, it, um, we use the code format of Action Replay to identify and synchronize game state variables across multiple game cubes, which keeps the games running the same game, basically. Um, we currently support 10 games, although they're not all fully refined yet. And we gave a talk last year on GCarCS, and if you want more info on that, check it out on YouTube. So, GCarCS was great on GameCube. But due to the details of its design, it was not easy to port to the Wii. So we started over completely with a Wii all in which we call Gecko Tunnel. Um, and that's currently in progress. Our goal with Gecko Tunnel was to use existing tools wherever possible and offload almost all of the processing to a PC side app, which, which has much more memory to work with than the Wii does. Um, so Gecko Tunnel uses the USB Gecko adapter, which is the same adapter to transfer data that we, that um, cheat code creators use. And rather than using the same code format of an existing game enhancer, Gecko Tunnel's Wii side code actually is an existing game enhancer, which is Gecko OS for Wii. And we added some standard game enhancer codes to dump and receive data. And we wrote less than 20 lines of assembly code and less than 5 lines of C code to integrate um, the Gecko OS Game Enhancer engine on the Wii with the official USB Gecko library, which we just compiled with um, GCC. No, no, not much trickery there. Um, everything is handled by Gecko OS without many modifications. Those codes I mentioned, the GCC, the GCC compiled USB Gecko library, and a custom PC side app, which is in C++. And this turned out to be much easier and a better solution than the prospect of porting GCarCS, which contained 32 gigabytes of custom ASM, Fusion OS, and custom C, which all had to run the GameCube, which was really hard to program in. So some advantages of this design. 
is um, there aren't any regional compatibilities. So with GCRCS and in a lot of cases official online gaming, if you're in a different region from someone else, you can't play against them. Um, and this is in GCRCS's case, that's because the games use different memory allocation for different regions. Uh, Gecko Tunnel can translate the addresses between the regions and the revisions. Um, so that solves that problem. And also, we can introduce new functionality uh, that wasn't even available offline. Um, so you can record ghosts and replays, for example. Just log or inject the data in the PC side application. So we could upload a ghost of you playing a racing game, and other people could download it and practice against you. Or you could record an entire multiplayer match and watch the whole thing later. Um, you can simulate controller data by injecting it on the PC side. So we did this with USB gamepads, so you can play GameCube or Wii games with a USB gamepad. Uh, but anything that can emulate a gamepad will work. So voice commands, connect cameras, even brain machine interfaces like Emotive and NeuroSky will work with this. Um, so also additional players can be ejected by the PC. And the easiest way to do that, there are several ways you can do that, is uh, inject the extra human players' data into the data that would normally belong to an AI controlled player. So an AI control player disappears and gets replaced by a human player. Um, we found that some games are very easy to add support for to play online. Others are much harder. And that's dependent mostly on the number of variables and the ability to directly manipulate those variables. So for example, in a racing game, you can pretty much summarize the game state by the player's XYZ coordinates. Not many variables, and it's easy to find them because you can control them directly. So the source for the data is changing the way you expect it to change and you find it. Real-time strategy games, however, are much harder. There are many variables. You can't always sort of manipulate them. It's really hard to find where they are now because of that. So that's difficult. Uh, the programming style of the game developer also matters. The games that use structures and object-oriented programming result in data being on pointers, and that makes the variables harder to find. I think global variables will be. Because uh, it moves around. And um, games written in high-level languages often have more complex data structures than games written in C or C++, which again makes them difficult to reverse engineer. And finally, some games just do wacky things. We work with one game that moves around all of its assembly code to a different address each time you boot the game, you can give the exactly the same settings. We don't know why it does that or how it's doing that, but it's kind of annoying. There are workarounds for those. Um, if a variable is in a pointer, GCRCS can handle pointer arithmetic, so we can find variables um, by following a pointer. And we think Echo can do that too, we haven't tested it yet. Um, if, you, if a game is using a high level language or a linked list or some weird data structure like that, um, the Gecko OS engine on which we base Gecko Tunnel can directly patch the game assembly. So we could find a, a piece of code in the game that knows where that variable is at any time. And then we just patch it to write a pointer to a stable location that we control. And that way we know where the variable is at all times. And if the data and the assembly are moving around, we can actually search memory on one time for a known assembly function and patch that. So it doesn't matter where the game decides to put it. Um, digital rights management also affects our work. Um, for anti-cheating DRM, many developers apply anti-cheating algorithms to their games online play modes, and we're fine with that. People shouldn't be cheating online. That's yeah. some, shall we say, overzealous developers try to prevent people from cheating offline. That messes up game enhancement tools, and that's not cool. With anti-piracy, it's similar. Many developers apply piracy prevention algorithms that actually detect pirated games, and we applaud this. People should be paid for their work. Some overzealous developers apply piracy prevention algorithms, which just crash the game and you patch it for any reason, piracy or otherwise. And again, that messes up our stuff, that's not cool. Um, are those effective? Well, most of the Wii hobbyists won't release workarounds that are designed to enable piracy or online cheating because they're against those things. And in fact, they even make a release really effort to intentionally make their code not work if you're using a pirate game or playing online and cheating. However, if developers try to block offline game enhancements, there are hobbyists out there who will uh, 
break that protection probably within about two weeks of the game coming out. What's the collateral damage there? Well, piracy online cheating might happen to as a result. Moral of the story, when you buy the game, you can do what you want with it offline, including enhancement. And if you're a developer and you don't want piracy or online cheating, block those, but don't block offline enhancement. That way everyone wins. Um, and actually, most developers are quite cool with this. Um, Sega actually facilitated the development of game enhancers in the past. Uh, sometimes game, game developers will actually write code for integrating with game enhancers, like was the case with Weapon of the Genesis, which had built in expand functionality. More recently, Nintendo actually increased distribution of an obscure Ethernet adapter for the GameCube when a game enhancer used it came out. Um, and legally, the work that we're doing is protected by Nintendo v. Galoob, which is a fairly well-known decision among tech circles. So we have a new development. Um, so the ability to sync data between a PC and a Wii, like we were doing with uh, sending USB gamepad data, will potentially enable PC-based head drivers to use on, PC on uh, Wii games. We started implementing this, it's not done yet, but we did learn in the process how to intercept the camera routines. And we then made a simple demo which hijacks the camera routines to generate both a left eye view and a right eye view, which results in a stereoscopic 3D on the GameCube or Wii. And I'm going to show you a quick video here. So, as you can see, um, there is a red and signed double image here, which shows the different left and right eye views. Um, and this is the game F0GX, which only does the Wii quite well. Um, if you were actually playing this yourself, um, you could actually play this in color as well if you wanted to. It doesn't have to just be gray rather than sign. I did that so you could easily tell what the two uh, views were. And this also works with stuff like the video 3D vision or 3D TV, stuff like that. And that explains all that work with this. Jeremy, can you explain a little bit about how the red versus green works to give people an idea of what's going on here? Sure, yeah. Um, so in this example, you would be wearing um, glasses with one eye being only seeing red and one eye only seeing cyan. And as a result, one eye gets to an image and the other and the brain uses them to see a 3D image. And um, newer 3D technologies like NVIDIA 3D Vision, and which is used in a lot of 3D TVs, they don't actually use colors over your eye, they just shutter glasses, which uh, turn on and off at, I believe, 120 hertz, so that, um, so that everything is in full color. Okay, back to this. Um, if we were to combine head tracking with this story 3D in the future, which we'd like to do, that would be a very immersive gameplay which would be quite awesome. So you move your head, and um, yeah. Also, a free look mode, like a spectator camera, would also be a potential application. And uh, we have some breaking news also. This is brand new, you are the first to see this. Um, the USB Gecko driver, which is what we use to transfer data between PC and Wii, normally only allows one Wii to be attached to a PC at a time. We figured out how to patch that to allow multiple Wii's to connect to one PC. And Gecko's allows built a router that links the Wii's. The result is LAN mode for Wii's. Um, so here we have a video of two Wii's playing Sonic the Hedgehog. So the left half of the screen is player one's way, the right half of the screen is player two's way. Each player sees himself and their opponent on their own way. And you'll notice that these middle two images are synchronized pretty much perfectly. Looks like it's not looking that great on this projector, but you can see that they're synchronized. And similarly, this screen and this screen there are synchronized as well. Um, and even when the characters were attacking each other and doing all sorts of crazy stuff like that, the game stays synchronized. Um, we measured about one trivial glitch in 15 minutes of play. It didn't affect gameplay or anything. I think we can, we can uh, fix that too. 
We're still working on the online play feature of Becca Tunnel. It's mostly implemented, but has a couple of bugs that are blocked from release. So stay tuned on that one. So some people think that official online gaming makes us irrelevant. But we, we think we still fill a pretty important role. And that's because many games only allow a subset of their features to work online. So um, only, only certain levels or only certain game modes work online in many online games. Gecko Tunnel doesn't have that problem. Also, our work allows many features that don't exist in many games, regardless of all in or offline modes. And since we're using peer to peer networking, even after the official servers get shut down, we'll still work. So, not obsolete. So, to wrap up, this is a list of games which we currently support in either GRCS or Gecko Tunnel. Not all the games are completely playable with all the features yet. And currently, these are all GameCube games. We hope to add some Wii games to this as well, now that we have Wii style models working. We're also hoping to add European and Japanese versions of games. Um, a lot of people have done work which enabled our research, so big thanks to everyone who's worked and utilized. And in particular, James Gilchrist sent us a donation to help fund our research, and Dr. Tritton supervised our work for honors research credit. And big thanks to everyone else who's on this list as well. If you're interested in our work, you want to try it out, maybe even add support for new games, you can find us at beclabs.postdoors.com, that's me, or fuzzycardsoftware.com, that's Martin. Um, Fuzzycardsoftware.com also hosts the official forums for both of our projects. And uh, please stop by the forums and say hello, beta testers and people who want to add support for new games. Anyone else interested, please stop by and say hello. That's it. Um, we have any questions? We have about two minutes for questions. All right. And uh, Brian, could you go ahead and get set up while Jeremy is taking questions? Yeah. Have you looked at the uh, math for head tracking? How have it actually started implementing the head tracking? Yeah. Um, so there's a researcher at CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Johnny Chung Lee. Um, he actually figured out how to do head tracking using the Wiimote as the camera and a sensor bar mounted on your head. And he posted some open source code for that. And we're tinkering around with that. We have it partially implemented in our code. Um, and um, he actually went on to create the Kinect for Microsoft. Right. Yeah, so we've, we've looked at the math. It's somewhat complicated, but it looks doable. Right. Yeah, it becomes a really big issue when you start turning your head to the side. It does. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not clear exactly how good we can make it, but... I didn't know if you were pulling from a library or if you were, like, somebody else's previous works or if you guys were having it right. on your own. Right, So far, we're looking at the algorithms that Johnny Chung Lee made, and we may tinker with other stuff as well. So, yeah. Okay, well, let's thank our presenter.